Man, f- <laughs> fucking look at this shit. It- it's a hot air balloon simulator, by the way. I I didn't know those existed either. Cause like, what's even really there to simulate aside from going up? I mean, I, I get that you need to like control the heat and air pressure or whatever it is going on inside the big boy, which is indeed what you do, but that's also about all that you do. You take into account the wind direction and intensities changing at certain heights and subtly alter altitude in accordance with that to get to where you need to be. It's just that- Holy shit man, look at these fucking menus! This is actually actual vaporwave years before that was even a thought. Slow down jazzy mall music and everything. And the cover art is of course some straight up Cassiopeia album cover shit and <laughs> I fucking love it. Honestly, PS1 promo and box art in general could be pretty fucking styling. You got those Euro as fuck Y2K vibes all over the place. Silent Hill 1's Japanese art coming out all super ominous with just the blood smeared across a tiled wall. Or those shitty early 3D models being shoved in everywhere like on the Tekken box art or Urguys' baller ass poster what I actually based this thumbnail off of. Or fucking Tobal 1 with those intensity blurs. <laughs> The Final Fantasy games came out strong too with the clean whites or R4 with the yellow and pre-meme jet black impact fonts, like god damn. Also, did you know that Umbrella CEO was called all caps GOD? Shit could be great for sure, did you just ignore like Mega Man Legends too? And uh, Crash Bandicoot always looking like he was only a step away from forcefully shoving his finger up your ass. Probably my favorite ones though are from these two games I have yet to play, being Shin Megami Tensei 2 and Shin Megami Tensei... If. Like, I, I, I don't even really know what to say about these other than that they make me feel very many emotion and inspiration. And I guess they also serve their maximum purpose as box arts. You see, when learning about games that have never left Japan as a kid, there usually ain't much to go by aside from the few scraps of articles and images. They feel distant, quite literally foreign. And so many a years were spent looking at the art for games like The Silver Case, Racing Lagoon, Moon, Twilight Syndrome, these two, and of course many other titles that I couldn't play simply because, well, these motherfuckers is story driven, so even if I would emulate a ROM, I'm not not sure I'd get a lot out of it. Or at least, so I thought back then. Now, I've of course played a fair chunk of Racing Lagoon and Moonlight Syndrome for this video series and was still able to get a lot of cool vibes out of them simply due to how awesome all of it looked and sounded. So I figured I'd roll up these bitches as well and, uh, well, they certainly seem like SMT games. In if you get to school dungeon pretty much right away and do that thing where you're entirely lost with way too many places to go at once. Yeah, sure, I get that there's a language barrier, but I, I've played a bit of Persona 1 and that shit was exactly like this too, even in English, so I'ma just assume that that's how they roll. L2 straight up gives you a full fucking map to explore with totally dick shit in regards to setting any of it up properly. Both of these were originally Super Famicom games, you see? And so they came out before the days of Final Fantasy proper realizing the cinematic introduction kickstarting your tail up good. Back then, it wasn't too strange for an epic quest to just kind of begin, as it does in If as well. Welp, I guess the world is evil now, might as well explore. They do both have imagery for days though. Floating, face hands, river dad, black bible shit, ominous doom miasma, a post-apocalyptic 80s futuristic hellscape. There's defo some frameable frames present here and also just the atmosphere in general is really dark and sinister. Which I know is more or less this series its modus operandi aside from the more uppy Persona games, but I have yet to experience this firsthand. 
I haven't played Nocturne or the Devil Sagas, but if those is anything like this, I wouldn't mind trying them out assuming they're not as maze-like and dungeon-heavy. There's also a lot of selective fourth wallness in either case, with people shrouded in theatrical darkness talking to you directly, as the evil music choir pat synths away in the background. It sorta takes the idea of role-playing by including you, yourself, into the conversation. But then instead of slay the dragon, it's like, lol, get scared on, bitch, look at this shit. Though that don't mean that there ain't time for that PS1 fuck on. Given that these games is mostly menus, text boxes, and copy-paste asset dungeons, though I'm, I'm not really having the greatest time not knowing what the fuck. It's pretty much as I brought it up last time with Linda Cube or Silent Moves. Those two definitely seem pretty dope from the outset too, but the actual core, i.e. the very dense stories, seem next to impossible to get to when you can't read the language. So basically what I'm saying is that I can't really do JRPGs. Which sucks, you know, as I'll always gravitate towards text-heavy story-driven games primarily. Now, luckily for us, I guess, games like The Silver Case or Shibuya Scramble and Scar of the Doll all made it over here by way of remake masters decades after the fact, and bigger titles like Police Knots have also gotten fan translations. But I still can't properly play something like Moon Remix RPG Adventure. Though, that ain't gonna fucking stop me from still doing it, though. <laughs> Moon is like the white whale, man. This game got E3'd to shit, shown off in magazines all over the place, only for ASCII to just nope out with no shits given. Granted, given the times, there's a fat chance it wouldn't have gotten the greatest localization anyway, but then the game did go on to do some quite legendary shit, getting nearly perfect review scores, being lauded for breaking literally every SNES level RPG convention of the time, and being cited today by tons of indie devs including Foxy Toe as inspiration. Not to mention it being spearheaded by Kenichi Nishi and Yoshiro Kimura, aka the dude who designed the actual physical world for Chrono Trigger, wrote the script for Incredible Crisis and Captain Rainbow, and co-directed Chibi Robo, and the man behind Rule of Rose, Tulip, Dandy Dungeon, and Million Onion Hotel. Basically, Moon is like the weird game seed that gave way to the weird game tree we still pluck cult classic fruits from even today with its influence reverberating past the walls of language barriers. And boy golly penis, is it clear to see why? I mean, it starts off with a very meta game within a game game that jumps all around the place with you sorta of playing it, but also not playing it. Like, you can walk around, for example, but you don't control the battles, as it is implied that the person sitting in front of the telly is doing that. Honestly, right now I fucking hate the fact that I can't read this shit because you just know that there's some clever stuff going on here. The first encounter, for instance, gets waved away as a joke and I want to know what the goddamn joke was, goddammit. What kind of meta JRPG tribute slash shit talking are we talking here? I must know! Anyway, you and your mans is fucking up the final boss when suddenly mom is all like, Yo, bitch! Get off the Sony PlayStay! And so you walk away all sad, when suddenly... And now, here we are in Tulip World, with the same types of character designs, voice mumbles, sounds, dense-ass atmospheres, and general starky dismissive outsiderness, and that you literally play as an invisible kid in a video game world, and I just fucking live for this shit. Oh, okay, maybe not that much shit. Honestly, it doesn't even really look like a PS1 game. Visually, in terms of the types of fonts and effects, the art style and sprite work, the very not Japanese character designs, the music being composed by 30 different guest composers, including the guy who ended up doing Tulip. Uh, something about it just feels timeless, like one of those schizophrenic reference-heavy indie games. What definitely adds to this vibe as well, aside from the hodgepodge visuals, is, for example, all of the music being diegetic.
The castle theme will first echo through the halls right up until you reach the throne room. Our shop themes can be heard blaring from a distance with stereo highlighting where they be. Thus, leaving the rest of the audio escape to the wind, birds, and excellently varied footsteps, or the actual NPCs talking to each other. And I don't mean that in that starting a conversation when prompted to JRPG sort of way. They're all just going about their merry way, discussing shit audibly with their clearly ripped from old movies voice mumble, whether you're there to listen to it or not. It really makes the game's world feel like a world. One where you aren't the main character. One where you're literally invisible. One where the actual main character is stomping around in his heavy, boisterous armor doing all kinds of actual video game shit, all the while you remain badgering around eavesdropping on people talking. Shit's bizarre and puts the game on a very meta-ass dip. Like, sucked into the screen stories are quite common, but they often put the suck E into the shoes of the main character. The role that they, while unsucked, also would have had and have been shown to you to have. And hell, I wonder where this now puts you. Like, you actually. Me in this case. Seeing as I was only partially playing the unsucked version, Am I now the suck boy? Is the suck boy someone I am controlling? Am I not worthy of the suck? We will never know. Well, we would if that Fantran finna gets finished, but until then you can take solace in the fact that the game is pretty much wholly unplayable to those not knowing Japanese, given that the entire thing is dialogue heavy fetch quest based. Though I have it on good authority that stuff gets pretty fucking crazy with what it makes you do and the places it makes you go. Definitely still very much being an RPG. Box art seems weirdly muted though. Doesn't quite convey the right that is this game though, does it? Granted, I guess it don't have to, but tying it back to something like the silver case, it's pretty fucking clear from all of the bizarre ass character art and imagery that this game is up to some shit. It pulled me in the moment I saw it, which is what I meant about shit like this being box art at max potential. And I mean, I can't really glean much from the reviews of the time because they Japanese and I can't really fuck with the screenshots either because a lot of it just looks like menus I can't read. So all I had to draw me in was these cool ass pictures on the front of the would-be box. Now, of course, the game matches this coolness with both the Remake Master and the PS1 original, which did get me to think, surely this bitch didn't exist in a vacuum, surely there are more PS1 games out there that look just as cool but are also wholly left in Japanese obscurity. This is just what the game actually looks like, by the way. Menus. Very stylish, highly Y2K, PS1 as fuck menus with a surprising amount of English text, but it is just menus and it is also just text. See, it kind of plays like her story in a way, being that these menus give way to audio and video logs and diaries, which are all in Japanese, that piece together the plot. This plot relates to an anime that I have not seen, with exciting lore reveals such as a character cutting her own hair. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel a bit out of my league here. Looks fucking great though, I wish actual operating systems had so much style over function mentality, with the pointless spinning 3D assets because future fucking code pouring onto the screen and even the this is a trial version level text prompts being stylishly worked into the backgrounds. Besides, it's far from the only cool looking ass anime game as well. Uh, j j just look at this Tekken artwork. <laughs> Hey 
Oh, Daddy, please stop yelling. Now that is some Tekken 2 ass shit right there. Belongs to a game called Devil Man, though, based on an anime that's all like. I. I just can't. Yes, you fucking can! Uh. You know, you're not tough or brave, just fucking stupid. I'll have to knock some sense into you. Fuck you! Huh? I don't really watch anime anymore, aside from JoJo, though even then I still haven't really caught up with part 4, but if I was to check out some shows, I think this gay subtext heavy cute boy tale might be right up my alley. The game though is actually a resi like with some cool ideas of its own. I mean, you got your tankies, baller ass cursor sound effects, and a big puzzle box map in which you find items to open doors, but you don't have pre-renders. Combat is wholly fleshed out with proper movesets and everything, and you can even do things like jump or crawl or action dodge out of harm's way by way of a double tap, and you also have a stanima bar. That's because this game is way more action heavy than your average resi, seeing as when you boy you frantically get chased by all kinds of creepy shit and need to solve simple puzzles under big pressure cause you a bitch, and when devil man you fuck everything up with your janky ass combos and make them your bitch. Or, uh, you know, at least you try to. Thing is, is that these hitboxes are a bit dick. And the animations are quite stiff and slow despite the speed of your enemies. Though, luckily, it is hardly its most prominent feature. In fact, the chase stuff informs the level design in a really cool way. Being that there's many shortcuts and loop arounds that allow one to juke the monsters or circumvent them entirely. It's defo quite different from how the Clock Tower series handles its chases, and a bit more in line with future efforts like Outlast, which also had many a juke loop room. It's pretty great, honestly, as it keeps the tensions high, but also makes you feel like you're being clever while shitting your own pants. Same goes for the puzzles that see you casually exploring an area first, then grabbing an item at the very end of it to unlock something back at where you started. As you can see from the map, things are definitely more length orientated than the girthier Silent Hill Resi or Fatal Frame maps. The controls also play into this very well, being that you feel in control enough to say jump over obstacles or hang from railings, but also still awkward Resi style enough to where the monsters remain a big threat with you not being able to run very well due to the stiff as a dick tankies and the frantically changing camera angles. This is really one of those games where its limitations only add to it. Except for when, you know, they make you do platforming, which is even worse than Overblood, seeing as your jumping arc is at a set length, but none of the gaps really seem to be that exact length, resulting in you over or under shooting pretty much every jump. And naturally, the camera angles add heaps to your sense of depth perception as well. On the flip side though, it's only used in a few select set pieces and because the game moves so fast it burns through its locales and events way quicker than your average survival horror game, thus turning it into a backtrackingless, one and done high area variety density effort, which just so happens to be my favorite kind of effort. Mmm, m'lady. It has a great-ass presentation, too. The acting, scoring, and directing during the many cutscenes are great. The models and locales look pretty good for PS1 as well, with lots of cool shading details and fleshed out animations, and... Given that it has some already established lore and characters, they can jump straight into intrigue as well, and also have some actual character moments, which is rare for this generally stiff as a board pro tag looking ass genre. Nanda, neko ka, odokasu na yo. よしよし。お前も俺と同じ迷子か。
The camera work and lighting during gameplay is also great, with some really atmospheric tracking shots that see the render distance obscuring the eerily lit hallways in and out of the abyss. And the textures have this sort of kinda cell shaded vibe about them that blends in really well with said lighting choices and the spooky yet vibrantly colored settings. Also, as a fun side note, the soundtrack makes heavy use of Spectrasonics' sound packs, and so you'll end up hearing a lot of noises that you'd also hear across the Silent Hill series. But yeah, I, I, I really like this one. It easily could have made waves over here as a hidden gem along with the other obscure but cool survival horror PS1 games. Most text is in English as well and there's guides out there so you can play it for the most part given that it's based off of a show and manga you can consume for story and also with using what I like to call anime Japanese aka Jotomate Nani Deska Iki as I explained it when King of Crusher. Thus, making it decently comprehensible on a base level if you're a big fat weebo with a knack for picking up languages. It's just a pretty great fucking game in that classic, more action-packed survival panic type of way anyway, similar to Resident Evil 3 or Dino Crisis. J just a bit more mellow on the puzzles than either, but that's a good thing for as far as I'm concerned as it keeps a much faster pace because of it. Not too sure about the beat-em-up levels though, like... Yeah, they are mostly inoffensive due to the enemies dying pretty quickly once you stunlock them, but the jank here is pretty fucking undeniable. Though, for my money, the ace presentation and the literally everything else make up for it all the way. Oh my god! The village! Hilda! On Hilda! What happened? Who did this? Brad. Run, child. You must hurry. Don't let them catch you. No. Don't do this to me, Hilda. Tell me who did this. You must be the Strega. I have orders from Lord Zauber to kill you and all Strega. And the villagers? Why did you kill them? For harboring you. It is a crime punishable by death. Okay, so I know that the PS1 is more infamous than famous for its writing, acting, and directing. Some of the FMVs were pretty good for sure, anything square comes to mind, but generally speaking when it comes to the in-engine stuff, things were usually far from great. Though that isn't for a lack of trying, mind you. Metal Gear Solid may have had some goofy lines and very rough approximations of what could be considered a face, but that fucking amp Ambition, man. Actual padding, dramatic sweeps and zooms, carefully composed shots that often show how small, fucked and lonely Snake truly was. You can tell that there was certainly a lack of experience and even technical capability, but that there also was loads of love for the Hollywood movies of the time. And the same goes for the game to Strega a fighter whose single-player mode is essentially a full-on feature-length film in which you play the action scenes. It's all very stiff and stilted and the acting isn't amazing either, despite Titus having a starring role. You are beaten. Surrender yourself. Man, th th they just really wanted to make a movie. Finally, the shackles of pixels and text and weird Nintendo rules were shattered and they just fucking went for it. And so, the awkward zooms get a type of endearing quality to me. The ambition is inspirational, in a sense. In a, hell, they did it, so why can't I, sort of way. It's also like the point I made back when talking about Vagrant Story, where the imperfections are like cracks within the work, allowing you to have a peek at the creative process behind it. Shit isn't obfuscated by polish or professionalism. 
the performances don't make you forget about the person in the booth because it sounds like a person in a booth. The backgrounds don't fool you into thinking that these is real places as you can still see the actual polygonal angles of the 3D tools or the drawingness of their art. And don't even get me started on the adorable dollhouse directing most of these games had, where the almost action figure like joints and big bulbous heads of the character models made the game feel like you were peering down onto a giant model table or indeed a dollhouse. Clock Tower comes to mind specifically in that case. Trail of Terror stretches across Europe, from Norway to England. I mean, that's not exactly stretching, bro, but, but okay. Essentially, though, you can kind of tell what they did and how they did it, simply because of how awkwardly they did it. And so, I think that shit like Devil Man kind of being one giant cutscene with the model trains driving back and forth and the mansion that ain't fooling nobody is pretty great and entertaining. Unlike the other games mentioned, however, I don't think Devil Man is really that way due to its raw ambitions. While certainly there, it's more so the way it is because it needed to convey the anime that it was based on accurately. And yo, if there ever was another PS1 game that embodies that spirit perfectly, then it's probably... Fisting the No-Ken is a game about Ken fisting his star. And also just like beating up loads of dudes in between all of the really ambitious and colorful PS1 cinematics. I mean, come the fuck on, look at this goddamn shit. I, I don't think I'm hyper bowling at all when I say that this is easily, by far and away, the most technically impressive PS1 game aside from maybe Vagrant Story. There's just so many assets and effects and beautifully hand-drawn shading and surprisingly solid models. The shit looks great. And it's also pretty fun to mindlessly beat the absolute shit out of tons of goons, kicking them up into the air, making them explode into a bloody pulp. Like, as far as Fist of the Noken games go, I'm, I'm glad they kept the last battle's enemy physics. Oh. Arzak, save the world! I am the only one who can save this world. Arzak's strength has increased. Uh, man, I, I, I love this stupid fucking piece of shit. But uh, yeah, this one is pretty great too. Not a very complicated game per se, but it's great fun, moves fast, ain't too clunky or stiff, doesn't fall into the early 3D beat-em-up camera traps, and again, fucking look at it. Plot-wise, it is just a quick rundown of the show, but in that it's very easy to follow if you're familiar with it, and it also adds something that the show doesn't have. Being stakes. Ken might be this immortal, all-ass-kicking power god, but you controlling him sure as shit aren't. As the game isn't exactly a walk in the park. Other than that though, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. I, I just needed to see it to believe. PS1 games don't normally look like this, and it's quite the unique title in that sense. And uh, yeah, th this is how the video ends.